about creating not just peer conservationists, but future peer conservationists. So I'm from Poor Education. Um, I've survived 10 years of teaching in the classroom, and now I've got the dream job of a women's field trip teacher, which I'll tell you a little bit more about in a moment. But I'll try not to go at a million miles an hour, because I've now only got 10 minutes. But dare I say it, it's about the big picture. It's not just about care. And in a room of people that have been talking about care all day, it's a little bit contentious. But when you're talking about education, we've got to talk about the big picture. And Lou Sanson talked about that really well this morning. It's about the ecology of New Zealand. And the care will rise to the fore because it's such a charismatic character. But first of all, we've got to get our kids outside and appreciating New Zealand's wonderful ecology. The whole bit. It's isolation, it's evolution, and what it's led to. So, there's the argument that New Zealand's curriculum is overcrowded and there's no room for the likes of care. I'd argue that's totally not the case. Education for sustainability is an integral part of our curriculum. It's in the documents, it's gazetted, it should be taught. And it's a really wonderful way to empower our students to take action, which is, again, a fundamental part of our curriculum. We're supposed to be getting our students into the community, their community, and taking action. So, to do that, we have to engage our students. And one way of doing that is through place-based education. And it's a bit of a theme that's really out there at the moment. People are talking a lot about it. But it makes an incredible amount of sense and it's really, really simple. We want students connect to connect with the environment around them, gain an awareness of the, their place in that environment, and through that, a sense of responsibility for it. We've got a bunch of kids out here in Wotu Tarakai, which is up the head of a Langitata, and they're planting tussocks, and what we discovered was the hardest ground imaginable. <laughs> and they loved it. It was a really hot day, it was exhausting work, and they loved it. And they had done very little work on the wetlands up there, but this sparked their interest, and they got amongst it, and they took responsibility for restoring this area of the wetland. So, technology. We've talked a bit about it today, seen some wonderful applications of it. And technology is a real vehicle for engaging our students. It motivates them. You know, we all know that students aren't ever far away from a screen. Well, let's use that to engage, to get them inspired, to get outdoors. And it also allows them to make connections with people. It's a way of collaborating and inspiring others. Those students that were planting on the edge of a wetland, we made a video about it, which thousands of other students saw in their classroom and hopefully got inspired to do in their own area. So it's a way of empowering our students. You know, they don't have to publish a book anymore. They don't have to be an absolutely amazing orator they can get online and they can share through social media, through all sorts of ways, using technology, and they can inspire other students. And that can be locally, nationally, or even globally. We've got a student here that's involved in the Kids Restore the Kepler program, and um, him along with other schools from the Taomo area got together, um, are involved in trapping and have shared their story online. So how can we make environmental education effective? There's a lot of discussion around the fact that we have to show outcomes. It's not good enough just to expose our kids to certain things. We've got to be able to say that they've learned something and they've, they've done something. But I argue that without starting somewhere, without the exposure, without the hands-on experience, you're never going to have an outcome anyway. And the outcome may not be measurable. You might inspire a student at the age of five that decides to be a politician. <laughs> makes change. Or someone that develops a transmitter that's really amazing, or a trap, etc. You know, it's 
stories are endless, but it's not something that we're going to be able to pinpoint back to a certain program. It doesn't mean to say that we don't stop trying to innovate with what programs we deliver. So we want to engage students hands-on, we want it to be accessible, and when I say accessible, it means that we have videos, we have transcripts, we have multiple ways of showing the same information so that if a student can't see too well, they're not going to be disadvantaged. If they can't hear too well, they're not going to be disadvantaged. We're going to make it accessible to everybody and technology helps us to do this. And it's going to be student directed. We've got students with great ideas out there. It was really cool to see um, that device that triggered when a peer was near, yeah. that, that a student signed. That's what we're on about. We want students to take an idea and run with it. And, you know, deeper learning and creating something. So we can get our students taking action and inspiring further learning. So some successful programs that I know of. Um, Kids Restore New Zealand has funded a whole lot of programs throughout the country, different schools. Um, got involved with the Kids Restore the Kepler, which was about five different schools involved in bringing birdsong back to the forest on the Kepler track. And we had kids setting traps, monitoring them, primary school and secondary school, and it was a great partnership. <coughs> We've got the new Docs Toyota Kiwi Guardians, where kids actually had to get outside <laughs> and um, find things and, and get information and get outdoors. We've got KCC, citizen science projects, and I thought the idea about the, the key one that's coming to fruition is a really great idea, and I'd love to see some application towards schools, you know, getting schools involved in that. The great Kiruru Count, New Zealand Garden Bird Survey, Nature Watch, they're all examples of successful citizen science projects. And we've got Learns Virtual Field Trips, yeah, that's what I'm involved in. Um, we put together field trips, and I'll tell you a bit more about those. We've got a website, learns.org.nz, and it's free to schools. So we're always struggling. Um, I work for Core Education, a not-for-profit organisation, always struggling, like everybody else, for funding, um, but we get sponsors for every field trip, along with Ministry of Education funding, to take kids to places that they wouldn't otherwise get to go to. And I'm a passionate outdoors person. I love to get out in, into the mountains, um, that's where I've grown a love for care. These are not to replace field trips, they're to inspire them. So, if we take friends with us, <laughs> well, we call them ambassadors. Schools can send one and it gets to go on the trip and they have a diary that ends up on the website and a photo, etc. and then they go back to the school. So that's one way to engage students. We have three days of live experience out in the field where I go out, get videoed, talk to schools on web conferences, and that all goes online as a package for schools to access for free, along with background information, which gives them a bit of domain knowledge that, so they actually know what is happening. We did a field trip on Kia here in Arthur's Pass in 2015 with the Kia Conservation Trust, so that was awesome. And we get kids involved in our field trips wherever we can. So while we were on that Care Conservation Trust field trip, we got kids that were working at the outdoor centre on camp and involved them in the field trip. They got to learn about care and then they got to share what they learnt with other schools all around the country. And as I said before, we, we don't just have the field trip as the three-day experience. We're about building domain knowledge so that kids can take part effectively in a meaningful way during the field trip by having some knowledge beforehand so that they can ask experts live in the field questions so they get to connect with scientists um, or engineers or whatever because we do field trips on all sorts of topics. We go down to Antarctica once every year and um, talk to scientists down there and that all gets beamed back for students to follow here in New Zealand. We've got daily videos and we sometimes have a really interesting audience, other times not so much. <laughs> and connect students live on location with the experts. So it's a really authentic way to learn. 
Um, and what we've found from feedback from schools is that kids really get motivated by it, they're really inspired, and it does lead to them thinking about what they can do in their own neighbourhood. So we've got the five group competences that I talked about. So kids ask their questions live during the field trip and talk to an expert. Um, that all gets done on a Adobe Connect. They can book in for that session, but then other schools can listen in. And then we have a bit of a chat session at the end where they can all type in questions that get answered live on the spot. That's recorded and posted it on our site to access later as well. The diaries that I write, unfortunately, the uh, ambassadors that come along on the journey don't write their own diaries, and sometimes I can have a huge handful of ambassadors that I have to write for, but um, it's all part of the fun. And we've, we've done some amazing adventures, Codfish Island, um, the Whale Cook Strait um, project following whales. Um, and it, it made me think actually about what Damien said, because on that trip we met whalers who were now involved in whale conservation. So I'm sure the same can happen for Kia. You know, we've got people who are guardians of our high country as farmers and we need to get them on board in protecting our Kia. So yeah, all about taking action. The great aim of education is not knowledge, but action. So that's what we want out of it, but we've got to start somewhere. So we've got to think about that big picture and getting the message out to thousands of students nationwide never goes astray and technology can help us to do that and it's happening here in Arthur's past year with the conservation theatre. <laughs> so hopefully it's going to be students that, um, experiences that students remember. We've got to visit Queen Pao Pao on her nest, tracked her down and really sad to hear that she's not with us anymore. Pretty sad. Have we visited that nest and shown that to lots of those students? So care conservation, we'll talk more about it in the panel tomorrow, but it's all about getting kids outside. We can leverage off other OTC activities that already exist. Any class that goes to a ski field should be given information about care mm -hmm. before they go. They should have to tip off that they've done a session with their class before they go. There are some really simple ways that we can get some information out there. Partnerships with tourism operators, we've talked a lot about that. Um, continued use of education providers that can get the message out to lots of people. And social media is really powerful for that. Um, webcams beside nests, you know, that would actually be a really good way to get the plight of care out there. So lots and lots of ideas and we can talk more about that tomorrow. But if you want to visit the Learn site, um, learns.org.nz, some of the, the field trips are passworded, free to teachers, and you can set up a log, log in if you're a teacher, but for this convention, if you use the username and log in here, convention, just one word, both username and password, you can check out the site. Thanks very much. <laughs>